Holly Cotton here, and I am so honored to have Miss Benicia Cole Watson with us today on Beyond the Fit. And Benicia is actually the owner and founder of Prime Lending Group. So first of all, let me let you guys know what that means. That means that Benicia owns her own bank. <laughs> so she is not playing any games and she is going to tell us all about her business, how she got to where she is, all of that great stuff. So thank you so much, Venetia, for joining us today. Okay, so first of all, I know that when you hear she owns her own bank, that's the first question people are like, wait, what? What does that mean? So before we even get into how you got to where you are and, and the process, because of course I did a Google search on you as well. So I kind of know a little bit of your background, but before you go into all of that, just can you define what it is that your bank is and what it means for you to be owning your own financial institution? Sure. So I own a company called Prime One Lending Group. I am the founder and the sole owner of this company. I'm a female, clearly. It's a Black-owned bank, and I am a veteran. The point of this bank is to service mortgage home loans for commercial and residential real estate. So it actually goes in line with my other company, which is a real estate sales company that I have agents working for me um, nationwide. I have 200 real estate agents that work for me across the nation. So I created this space so that way, first of all, we can have a place to service our customers who are looking to buy homes, but of course, to service the nation and strengthen our community and so forth and so forth, just to have an opportunity to do business with the Black-owned bank. Okay, so that is so awesome. One, I love that. I, I love when, one, people have a passion and they're able to go with their passion, but also when that passion is something to help other people. So that's why I definitely wanted to highlight your story and highlight you because not only is it that all of these things that you're doing are still the first of this, the first of that, which that just drives me bonkers that we're still having the first black woman for so many things. But I love that you are also breaking those barriers for that. So one of the quick facts that I looked up about you is I know you said that you're with the real estate and things like that. And the first thing that popped up when I did my little Google search, it said sells 400 plus young homes yearly um, for the past three to four years. So one, for people who aren't in real estate, can you just tell us just the magnitude of that accomplishment by itself? Yeah, I got to be honest. When I read it, I shock myself too. I'm living in this space. I'm just doing but it is an accomplishment. The average real estate agent only sells eight homes, eight to 10 homes a year. And so to be able to scale and sell that much, that's definitely someone who's going above and beyond with their clients. I'm heavy on the investor um, space of clients. 90% of my clients have been investors. So a lot of times they repeat customer you know, um, situations with me. They buy in bulk. They tell all their friends. So I'm really the go-to person that's adding value to a big group of investors who are purchasing land and, and homes and all that stuff like that. So that's how I'm able to scale. And I do help everybody, but I just have a heavy presence with people who are investors as well. Okay. Love that answer, Benicia. Now, can you tell us, because also when I look at your, I guess the foundation, because I'm always interested, you know, how people got to where they, they are. And it said that your majors were not in what you're doing right now in college or whatever. So can you tell us like what your plan was whenever you graduated high school and then how you migrated to this specialty? Yeah, so I was working corporate America. I was actually trying to gravitate more towards government, um, working in Congress, um, doing something on Capitol Hill. That was the goal. I have a law degree. And, you know, that was pretty much segueing me into, into politics. And it's like God had another plan. And I got to a point where I was working in my corporate job and I hit a, what's considered a glass ceiling. I just started, I was putting in for positions to go up, but I wasn't going up. I kept going lateral. So I just said, you know what, God, is this something that I'm supposed to be doing? Is this the job for me? So I just started praying and asking God to show me, lead me and guide me. And he spoke to me and said, get a real estate license, like clear as we're talking right now. And I got up from meditating, praying, and I ordered the real estate course. And I didn't understand what, why would you say, go get a real estate sales license? I'm working this job. I'm working 60 hours a week. 
Um, I've owned real estate properties. I'm an investor myself, but I never thought to sell. And when I first got in the business of real estate as a sales agent, I sold over 200 houses my first year while still working that corporate job. And then the second year, I sold over 350. So that's when I knew this, the first year didn't even hit me. The second year, I was like, okay, God, what are you doing? <laughs> Where is this going? But that's how I got started in real estate. Okay, so one, I love this whole story because women in real estate has always been something that's not the norm. So first, how did you start even going into that whole investment I want to own property, I want, you know, because it's just not something that women and even black women are going into. And, and like, it's just not that's not typically a predominantly black woman field. So how did you get into this? So initially just buying a home, I was a consumer. So I just figured, you know, why pay rent and you can't put holes in the wall? You don't get a return on your investment. Um, you know, it was a small purchase, my first purchase, but that opened the door for many more. Um, but just by building equity and being able to cash out and buy a bigger home and a bigger home and a bigger home. So it just kept getting bigger and creating a bigger train for me. But the initial concept was I don't want to pay rent to someone that's it doesn't do anything for me. That person who owns that property, most likely it's an investment for them. They own a primary residence. And if they're able to own a primary residence in this one investment property, they most likely have more investment properties. So it was a mindset thing for me. It's like, you know, I'm not going to just be, I'm not, I don't want to just exist. I wanted to have something to call my own for my legacy and my family. But now, did you find that there was any, I don't want to say resistance, but what were some of the obstacles that you got? Not, we're not even going to get into the, the owning your financial institution obstacles yet, but just obstacles with actually starting off with that. Like I said, there's not a lot of support for women, black women, especially whenever, you know, 10 years ago, like now, thankfully people like you are giving back and educating people that are trying to start. So what were some of the obstacles that you were running into and that you can share to other people that, you know, you push past and you were like, no, this is what I'm going to do. So as the consumer, what were some of the obstacles that you had being a woman trying to in invest in properties 10 years ago? Yeah. So when I started buying property, I was 19 years old. So first of all, there's not a lot of 19 year olds that are looking at property. I'm going up against people who are already doctors, attorneys. Yeah, it's intimidating. I was nervous. I was scared. I wasn't gonna, I wasn't sure if the owner would choose me because you know they can see, you know, information if they really dig for it. So it's kind of like, you know, it was a it was a it was a space of anxiety. Um, the process itself, it went the way that it normally goes. You have to have a good credit score, a decent credit score. You have to have income um, and you, you have to have a good debt to income ratio, which means that you pay your bills consistently on time and all that good stuff like that. So as long as you have your financials in order, it's almost like the door can't close on you. You know, the other end of it is, yeah, you know, uh, in a space right now, it's been publicized that 50 percent of applicants that are African-American that are in our space, we get denied for home loans. Right. That's just getting publicized when I was applying that stuff wasn't on the internet. So it was like, you know, you're, you're just taking a chance. And thank God I was willing, I was able to make the purchases that I chose to make. Um, but the biggest obstacle is on our end first, because we have to take our, care of our numbers and make sure that our financials are in a position to be able to qualify. And I think that's the biggest hurdle that we actually face as a community. Okay, great information, great information. And I'm glad, and that's kind of what you are educating whenever we're talk about why you're actually traveling and what these things are that you're doing as far as the, the like I know you're in Houston doing an event this weekend. So we'll get to that later. But what about whenever you made the decision to say, you know what, I want to own my own bank. <laughs> like that's not something most people just poof. I think I'm going to start doing it. So can you tell us about that process? Because that is definitely a unique <laughs> story. Yes. So it's funny because I actually went to go speak at an event 
and I'm telling my story about real estate, how I sell a lot of houses, how I have agents that work for me, my story, right? And after I finish speaking, someone pulls me to the side and says, hey, would you like an opportunity to own a bank? So it actually came to me. I didn't come to the to the scenario, right? So when the guy talked to me, he said, hey, you know, um, you know, owning a bank, these are the benefits. And I'm like, I'm not in financing. I don't know anything about a bank. You know, I, this is not for me. He, I sell real estate. He said, well, doctors don't own the clinics that they work in. And I was like, uh, you're right. Like there's doctors at work and they don't own this building. Owning a bank is owning the building. You're just the boss. You don't have to do the actual work. I can hire the employees to do the work. So I got to thinking and I was like, okay, I, I took, I took, um, I left that event. I flew back to Dallas, Texas, because that's where I live. And by the time I landed, I had thought of a name of a company. I started buying domain websites. I was like, if this thing pops off, I got to get ready. And so uh, within two weeks, I was actually up and running as a federally chartered bank. All the attorneys, all the people in position, they just basically have to vet you. I'm, I'm what's considered a full eagle lender. So I'm, I'm able to lend at the highest power approved by Fannie Mae, which is one of the entities that services in the finance world. And so um, it was actually a pretty smooth process. I didn't have a lot of um, pushback or pullback. I didn't have anything that they found that, that would disqualify me. It really takes the financial acumen. It takes the stability of you to be able to hold the line of credit that services the loans as a direct lender. And because I was able to qualify for that financially, the door just opened up for me. And what's interesting is that six months into finance, they actually, I was actually appointed as an advisory member on the National Mortgage Corporation um, board. And now I sit on the board representing black uh, people and black voices in the community in the space of, of mortgages and lending. So it opened so many doors for me to be able to um, be in this position and help other people. But that's kind of how it all got started. It just kind of fell on me. And I didn't even know anything about a board. They actually came to me about that. So it was just like, you know, things just fall into position when you are sitting in your purpose. Right. Yeah, that's that's very unique. And like you said, sometimes just having a passion, you were doing something that you really enjoyed. People could see that. So having that passion sometimes that opens the door to defining what your purpose is because we all have passions. It's just now what am I supposed to do with all of these awesome things that I'm thinking of? So I love, I love that. I love that. Now, I know you were saying that some of the, the things and how everything fell into place, but what were some of the obstacles that you had to get over with this? Because I know that it's also the obstacles. So some of the obstacles that I face in the banking space are, you know, I am a small business, so I am competing against PNCs, the Chase, the Citibanks, the Wells Fargo's, all these bigger names, right? So the obstacle that I face is that first and foremost, I have to make sure that people know that I am a true institution and that your information is not just going to go into my database <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll steal all your credentials, right? I get a lot of people, they're like, I need to talk to somebody. I want to touch somebody. I want to make sure that this is a, a good, legit scenario. So once we pass that scenario of people vetting and making sure that it's a qualified in institution, um, I'm very competitive with my rates. So it's actually the opposite. Once they get in, they realize, oh, this is good. Like, for instance, um, yes, yes uh, Thursday, I had a deal where um, someone was at another bank, a big bank. And they were at like basically 6%. And when they came to my bank, finally, after telling the agent several times that they should bring their deal, I got them a 4.125 and it blew their socks off in this market where we're in inflation. So it's like, I have to <laughs> go the extra mile to make sure that they know, no, you're going to be taken care of. Just you'll see. Right. So that's almost the biggest challenge that I get. Um, the second biggest challenge is educating our people because it's not in it, the challenges are not with other institutions you know trying to fight them it's sometimes within our own space it's like i got to make sure that are the ones who apply they when they apply they have business bank accounts maybe it's not set up the right way well that's going to happen if they apply anywhere but i noticed that because i have a big bulk of us that apply i get more of the same scenarios over and over again it's like oh you have an llc but you haven't 
been in business for two years. It's just education in reference to being able to use that income as qualifiable income in the space of mortgages. So it's a lot of education that takes place. Okay. Yeah. That would make sense. That would make sense. And that's so awesome. Yeah. And it's, it's so hard being, because even though you are technically like a bank and a financial institution, people still look at you as like a small business yourself. And you have to be like, no, that's, (laughs) I'm not, I don't have to prove myself to you guys. So I know that has to be tiring to continually have to do that. So kudos to you. I'm so glad for all the success. Now, what about, I know kind of like when you, and that's, it's funny because that's all, that's always like sort of a a cliche, like, oh, so now you own the bank, you know, you own the bank. So now that you own the bank, what, what other goals do you have for you as far as your business development or personal development? Because like, you own the bank now. So (laughs) that's usually the goal to get there. So now that you've reached that point on the spectrum, what else do you have? There's a couple things with me. um, I have a a soft spot for entrepreneurs. So I have a thousand different loans that I, that I offer, but one is the, one of the ones that I push is the entrepreneur loan where you only have to show your bank statements to qualify for a home, your business bank statements. So if you're in a space where you're earning your own money, maybe you're 1099 or you're just a bank, a business bank owner, I mean, I'm sorry, a business owner, um, I can take your bank statements from your business bank account and qualify you with a copy of your ID. I don't want your tax returns. So I'm really focusing on that because what happens is that when you present your tax returns, it lowers your purchase power because most business people write everything off, right? And so I'm able to push that as a as a as a product for the people that are like us in you know in our spaces where we're now switching over into entrepreneurship in a heavy space. Um, and then the second thing that I'm doing is I've created a foundation, and that foundation is going to send two high school students to real estate school every single year. You have to be a graduating senior. You can apply. You have like a four or five month period where you can where well, what you apply. And then once you apply, we'll go ahead and select somebody. And then it's going to send two people free and clear paid for to real estate school because every kid doesn't want to go straight to college. So, you know, those are the things that I'm implementing. I did a back to school drive for elementary school where I gathered up supplies so I can help some of the schools in the Dallas market. Um, But it started in Dallas, but it's going to grow legs because my company that I have is a nationwide company. I do every state except New York on the banking side. And then on the real estate sales side, I actually serve every state as well. I have agents all across from New York to L.A. and everything in the middle. So the foundation is starting in Texas, in Dallas, Texas, but it's actually going to go to Houston next. It's going to go to L.A. and then it's going to just grow legs. So I'm going to present an opportunity where I'm just out there supporting as many people as I can to get them into the space of understanding generational wealth, building assets, and owning some form of real estate at some point in their life and not just being a renter, you know, and throwing their money away. That's so awesome. And I think people don't realize, but that is a huge key to being successful is always to give back some kind of way. Like you weren't given this to waste it. So I just find that the people have so much success when they are giving back. So I love that. I love that. That is so great. So Benicia, why are you in Houston right now? What's going on? How are you traveling? Do you have events? Like, why are you? Because that's where I'm residing. So I want to know why you are in my city and what you're doing to help us. Yeah, so I am in Houston, Texas this weekend for an event called Rentalpreneur Summit. And what it is, is it's empowering people to either invest in short-term rentals, understand the short-term rental space like Airbnbs and such like that. Um, and I was a lineup uh, speaking yesterday. So I was on the women in real estate panel. It was about four of us. We all had different backgrounds, but we came together to present our experiences in real estate. Um, I was a keynote speaker. That went really well. But Houston, I love the city. I'm here all weekend. So I'm ready to, you know, experience some turkey legs and everything else you guys have to offer. (laughs) Well, don't blame us for high blood pressure. That's for sure. Um, (laughs) 
Well, there are actually, there are a lot of vegan and healthy options now. So kudos to Houston for also transitioning into that as well. So I love to see that. And, uh, and then of course it was like black restaurant month this month. So tons of good options. So just so you know, we all don't have to eat the, the salt, the sodium turkey, <laughs> but it's good. Uh, <laughs> No, exactly. Exactly. So mix it up, mix it up. So Benicia, can you tell anyone that's listening how they can get in touch with you? What kind of, like you said, there are several things that you're doing the, as far as the, the education, the programs, all of that stuff. So one, tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you, what you offer to assist people as well as the giving back and any social media handles that sure. you want to So as of right now, I'm assisting people to give back. I am focused on the scholarship. So if you have a student in the Dallas area that's interested in real estate, please reach out to me. I'm starting the foundation for a school, but listen, let's just face it. I have a big heart. So I, we, we can talk if someone needs mentorship, um, if you're already a real estate agent, if you are looking to get in the space of real estate, if you just want to be a consumer and own real estate, um, you can follow me at, at Benicia. It's my first name, B as in boy, E-N-A-I-S as in Sam, H-A underscore underscore. And I also have a website on my page that I can, you know, receive messages and stuff like that. So just get in touch with me if you need me. Okay, awesome. And then also, if you're looking for a financial institution, <laughs> Prime One Lending is where you need to go as well. So I love that. So thank you so much, you guys. That is Benicia Poole Watson, the owner and founder of Prime One Lending Group. And you know that I always love... I know my show is called Beyond the Fit and we go beyond just looking fit. And I thought that this was really important. I love highlighting dream catchers, people that are following their passions. And not only that, but what are you doing to give back? How is your story affecting other people? And why do we need to highlight these stories? So thank you so much, Benicia, for coming on Beyond the Fit.